Okay, RJ, you can go ahead. Excellent. Welcome everybody um, to this discussion on Manitoba's aquaculture opportunity. Uh, I'll be your moderator today, RJ Taylor. I'm a second generation fish farmer from Ontario. Um, I wanted to open um, by saying that our friends at Manitoba Agriculture wanted to extend a warm welcome and a thanks for all of you participating today. A few housekeeping items before we, we get to the good stuff. Um, today's panel is being recorded uh, and it will actually be available on the Manitoba Protein Advantage YouTube channel. And everybody who attends today will be emailed a link right after our, our session. So we're gonna start today with a few very brief presentations from our panelists. Uh, and then we're gonna get straight into the discussion questions. We welcome questions from all of you. Um, we just ask that you put them into the chat and make sure to include your name and, and where you're from so we can kind of know the, the, the context behind what you're asking. Uh, we may not get to every question, um, but we're gonna try. Uh, if you would like closed captions today, uh, Zoom has that capability initiated. You can, you can turn it on from your own computer. Uh, and if you don't like how our heads and presentations and things are jumping around, um, you can also change your own view just by going to the top right. There's a view button and you can you can play around with um, settings and maybe choose a, a, the side by side. So, so we have a pretty incredible panel on today um, with this experience from across the aquaculture sector um, and across the country, really. Um, I, I'll give them very brief intros, um, but I will let them do a much more fulsome self-introduction in their, their presentations. Uh, we have Justin Henry. If you want to give us a wave there, Justin. He's worked in many parts of aquaculture over the last three decades, from net pens to recirculating farms, from sturgeon to salmon. Uh, he's the owner of Henry Aquaculture Consult, Inc. We also have Chuck LaFleche here. Um, Chief Financial Officer and Equity Partner for Sapphire Springs, which focuses on raising Arctic char uh, in Manitoba and across Canada. Uh, and we have Sean Pressy, who's the Aquaculture Development Officer for the Wabatech Business Development Corporation. Sean and Wabatech work with dozens of First Nations on setting up aquaculture projects. And Sean can get into how he's worked all across the sector too. So. Before we jump in, um, I'm just gonna share one really quick slide, um, which gives a little bit of an overview for where the aquaculture sector is at in Manitoba, um, and that teases some of the opportunity that we're gonna get into today. Okay, thumbs up, everyone can see the one slide here. Okay, great. So um, aquaculture in Manitoba includes mostly pond culture and, uh, and some recirculating. Um, typically focused on cold water species like rainbow trout and Arctic char. There's currently no um, cage or net pen farming in Manitoba. Um, as, as, as you see here, production's possible and it's happening, um, though we haven't exceeded 150 metric tons. And I think you'll hear today over the next hour that there is significantly more opportunity to grow uh, fish and seafood sustainably um, in Manitoba. So. Uh, and fish farming isn't just the, the fish farmers on the ground, it's a big economic development opportunity that includes the suppliers, the feed companies, the processing, all of the, the, the many trades and, and supporting sectors that, that are part of that, all the way down to the food processing, the retailers, um, and the end consumer who gets to enjoy it. So Manitoba, um, certainly well positioned for a very sustainable aquaculture industry. Uh, there's lots of farming expertise in the province, um, existing farmers and, and, and folks in the ag sector uh, looking to diversify um, relatively low cost energy, uh, something that your neighbors here in Ontario are rather jealous of, I'll say. Um, and there is sort of existing processing plants, existing farm operations that, um, that would be ready to hit the ground running. Lots of fresh water, something that probably doesn't even need to be said. Um, and a really, really great opportunity to service uh, both sides of the country, um, which, which, which we'll get into. So as we get into some of the, the, the challenges and things, I think those will bubble up in our conversation today. But so what I'll do here, I'll stop this share, but I might toss it over to you, Justin, um, to give us our first um, brief presentation of the day. Thanks, RJ. Good morning, everybody, and afternoon for some of you. 
Around uh, 30 years or so ago, uh, I studied aquaculture at the University of British Columbia and went on to study aquaculture biotechnology at Aalborg University in Denmark. <clears throat> After returning to Canada, I entered the aquaculture industry uh, and after uh, many years, eventually went on to manage all the different stages of aquaculture uh, production, including uh, broodstock, which you can see some coho uh, broodstock and, and sturgeon broodstock here, uh, as well as the uh, hatchery stages and uh, grow out. Also uh, processing and, and sales. <clears throat> here we can see some caviar processing and, and uh, coho salmon processing. Uh, with this company, we produced about 4,000 tons of salmon uh, per year uh, and about one ton of sturgeon caviar. In addition to the coho and the and the sturgeon in these pictures, uh, also reared uh, Chinook salmon, Atlantic salmon, uh, rainbow trout, uh, and sablefish or black cod. Now, some of these species are uh, good potential candidates for Manitoba, notwithstanding any regulatory limitations. In addition to the net pens and the circular tanks shown uh, in the previous slides, aquaculture also takes place in uh, raceways. Uh, the top left here, uh, uh, older raceway in uh, Japan, uh, and the top right uh, in the US. Uh, they're also floating solid wall tanks uh, in the bottom left, that's uh, in British Columbia. And then there are giant offshore uh, pens on the on the bottom right. That's Ocean Farm One in in Norway. And uh, this picture is just uh, actually being sent in for some repairs. Aquaculture is also carried out in ponds. So we have um, small uh, hobby sized ponds as well as uh, massive ponds, uh, like in the top right uh, in Egypt. There are also indoor systems, uh, some of which are recirculating aquaculture systems. I built my first uh, recirculating aquaculture system, or RAS, uh, in 1998, and my first aquaponics system in 2010. Uh, and some of these systems uh, could be very well suited for Manitoba. I've always, um, here we have, uh, coho uh, broodstock uh, program. Uh, so I worked with a group to develop uh, the world's first monosex female uh, coho broodstock. Uh, this facility was uh, actually the world's first uh, OIE certified disease-free uh, compartment for finfish, uh, which enabled us to export uh, eyed coho eggs around the world. So egg supply is a main consideration uh, for any species uh, that you have to grow uh, and something to be considered uh, in Manitoba. I've been interested in organic uh, production um, for a long time and helped to develop uh, the Canadian organic aquaculture standards uh, with a, a group of um, dedicated uh, people uh, in, in Canada who, who uh, put a lot of work in it uh, over many years. Uh, this standard was launched in 2012, uh, and presently I chair the technical committee, uh, as well as the standards interpretation committee for that standard. <clears throat> uh, I'm the president of the Canadian Organic Seafood Association, and if anyone would like to join, uh, please let me know. Certification in, in uh, Manitoba with uh, these different systems is possible. In 2016, I started a consulting uh, business uh, to provide some aquaculture expertise um, and also launched a graduate uh, certificate in aquaculture at the University of British Columbia. I've worked with a variety of clients uh, around the world, and, and these are uh, some of the countries um, that I've worked with, including um, recently right here in Manitoba. Why aquaculture? Of all the animal proteins uh, that can be farmed in Manitoba, uh, why would someone want to farm fish? There are a whole bunch of reasons. <clears throat> when if we look at this uh, GSI sustainability um, 
uh, report here, we can see that uh, Salmonids in particular uh, have the best fee conversion ratio of the other farmed animal proteins. Salmon have the highest edible yield and also the lowest carbon footprint. Also, when we look at the color fair protein producer uh, index, this ranks the sustainability of animal protein farmers in the world. <clears throat> and uh, the, the names are pretty small there, so I'll uh, just uh, expand the, uh, the top uh, 10. So the top three sustainable protein producers in the world are salmon producers. Uh, and actually seven of the of the top 10. Uh, and this is why we need to focus on aquaculture. And why in Manitoba? Well, today we're going to get some uh, good ideas why. That's it. Back to you, RJ. Thank you, Justin. That was, um, thank you for sharing your background and sort of sowing the seeds for, for why we're here today, which is great. Um, I think we'll pass it over to you, Chuck, if you wanted to share your screen and tell yes, us a little bit about morning, what's everybody. happening in Manitoba. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. And uh, I almost, I'm always amazed when I listen to Justin and his background. Uh, so let me get into presentation mode here. So yeah, I'm an accountant by profession. I'm a serial uh, entrepreneur. And uh, through those uh, business dealings with uh, a number of uh, equity investors, I got involved with this project a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, you guys can see my screen now. And so essentially we we have a pretty bold vision in that we we're launching a 5,000 uh, metric ton uh, Arctic char farm. And as was previously mentioned, most of the char and, and char, uh, char is a salmonid along with salmon and steelhead trout. Most of the char farms in Canada are 50 to 100 ton farms. So it's very much a cottage, uh, you know, industry. Uh, and what we were hearing from from the market and you know places like the Boston Seafood Show was you know we would we buy more if there was more consistent uh, supply so our plan is to develop consistent supply and we're doing that by um, it's maybe a little bit bold but we're building the largest Arctic char farm on the planet uh, essentially um, we are going to be producing, as I mentioned, uh, 5,000 uh, kilograms of fish, uh, depending on the size. We and we, we think it'll come in at about 1.7 uh, kilograms as our harvest average harvest weight. And uh, essentially, we plan to address the growing global demand for for protein and specific for for salmonids uh, right here in uh, in Manitoba. One of the things I'm quite proud of, if I can get there, is our management team. And uh, so we've got. Uh, uh, Ken Blair, who's uh, who's started up a, a number of businesses, again, serial entrepreneur who's uh, who's heading up uh, as a CEO. Uh, I'm taking on the finance role. Uh, we've we've announced last week and we and, and it's uh, so it's now official. We've made our first acquisition. So we acquired a company called Icy Waters um, officially last week out of um, out of Yukon and Icy Waters has. Uh, uh, essentially um, 20 years experience in the marketplace. They're the largest uh, seller of ova, uh, of eggs in, in uh, Arctic char specifically, um, primarily in Europe and across Canada. And, um, and so we're pretty excited about that because with that, we got we got Doug Hodson, who's an operator and uh, did a lot of work with, with um, genomics and with the uh, on the biology side of the house uh, we're also really proud to announce that Justin has uh, joined the team. Uh, you know, obviously not full time; still has his business, but we're we have access to Justin uh, as chief technology officer and really overseeing the the development strategy. Again, couldn't find a better uh, better person as far as I'm concerned. We've also got a um, somebody we're working with on a contract basis called uh, the Wendy, Doctor Wendy Vandersteen, and she's a PhD in uh, in aquaculture. She actually grew up in uh, in the Interlake, uh, about uh, 20 kilometers from our site. Our site's about 40 minutes north of Winnipeg, uh, in the Interlake, 
and um, she's great. And she actually works for the the firm that supplies us our feed right now, uh, Tapelo Feeds out of uh, out of uh, BC. She's a, a great resource. Has done a lot of research on the feed side. Has done a lot of uh, research projects with government. So we're really happy to have her. And we're also lucky to have a guy named Brian Hodge with uh, probably 40 years experience in food packaging. He worked with Winpack, which is a, a billion dollar company nobody knows about in Manitoba and, and the packaging side. So he, for instance, today he's with Nestle in Wisconsin. Uh, he works with Nestle, with uh, with McCain's and is an expert in uh, packaging protein and knows everybody in this, in the industry on the distribution side, whether it's Calkins and Burke in BC or Brown and Company in uh, Portland. Uh, has a deep knowledge of this distribution channels, which is important for us, and also has a lot of knowledge on the processing side. And so we're we're really proud of our team, the, the, and uh, the, those are the the key figures. So Arctic Char, for those that are not familiar with it, again, it's a member of the Salmonid family, and uh, and uh, Justin corrected me and how I've, I've been pronouncing that. So hopefully I got that right, uh, Justin. But essentially, we're uh, it, again, it's it's a uh, I think it's a fantastic tasting uh, fish. Uh, similar in texture and health to salmon. So we often compare it to salmon in terms of, you know, industry trends. Um, to me, the the upside is it's currently represents less than 1% of the salmon market right now. And so we don't need to move the needle a lot. And frankly, we're going to be increasing the world supply by about 50% by introducing 5,000 metric tons. And we're of the opinion uh, in the major distributors we've talked to, we'll have no problem moving that product. And so uh, we're very excited about um, about that. Uh, in terms of the the uh, I mentioned the acquisition of uh, icy water, so that's pretty important for us. We've actually made two acquisitions now. We bought an, um, a former Department of Fishery, Fisheries and Ocean site in um, in Manitoba in the Interlake. For those that aren't familiar with uh, with uh, that region of the province, it's literally between the lakes. It's about forty kilometers north of. Um, of the perimeter in Winnipeg, it's a, it's it's a, in the, frankly in the middle of a field, but it's very strategic. The we can't take credit for that. The uh, the federal government thirty years ago wanted to set up a research facility for char, specifically, and they chose a site on top of an aquifer with uh, you know five million year old water, and it's an aquifer that runs from um, Great Slave Lake right down to uh, Minnesota. The Seagrams uh, made uh, Crown Royal for years using that same water. Uh, the beauty is the water comes out at 6.5 degrees, which is very close to what um, char like. That's a big advantage over some of our competitors that are dealing with 20, 22 degree water and have to spend a lot of money uh, cooling it. Uh, so the, the site's ideal. We have 160 acres. Uh, we have seven wells. We literally can put a glass down and the water comes out of the ground. Uh, so we're very, uh, and all the, all the, the regulatory uh, side has been uh, uh, already done with the province in terms of uh, discharge. But again, being a RAS system, not a lot of discharge. We're going to reuse 99% of our water. And so, um, uh, but so these two acquisitions were really important for us, giving us a head start with, you know, a, a basically a 28 year uh, um, brood stock uh, in, in Manitoba. And then through the acquisition of Icy Waters, Again, they have over 20 years experience with their brood stock. And when we first asked them, where did you get your char? They said someplace in Manitoba called the Interlake. So it's basically our char. So the, the Nyack strain, which is the our strain of Arctic char, uh, is basically the, uh, both of our sites are uh, are based on that same strain of char. So we're, and, we, and it's really giving us immediate benefits in terms of not only access to people, but to market. So we now have clients, you know, we sell eggs now through Icy Waters to uh, to Lithuania. Uh, we got a, an order this week from Poland. So it's really giving us, uh, and we have a lot of Canadian clients as well. So it's really give it, get, giving us nice insights into the marketplace. Uh, and it will certainly help determine our uh, growth strategy uh, going forward. In terms of construction, we're about 30% of the shell is done. So we're building 14 acres under roof. It's a significant building. That's about 620,000 uh, uh, square feet. Uh, so the top picture is, uh, that picture is probably two months old. That's what that's what you'd see today. And the bottom picture is the artist's rendition of the completion. So we're, uh, we're moving along. We're about 20 million into it in terms of uh, our own money. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the, the, the dollar value of the project. 
This is an overview of the site. So uh, from left to right is, is from north to south. So the north end of the building, which you saw in that photo, uh, is where our, our offices will be. This is this will be our, uh, currently our hatchery is off site. It's a couple, three kilometers away. We'll be moving the hatchery operations into this uh, first section here. And then as, as the fish move down the line into the grow out area, that this is a grow out area. Every one of these circles is a 50 foot tank. That's a pretty uh, big area. And then on the top here, you've got uh, purge tanks and the processing facility is uh, is here with access to uh, to loading docks. And we're anticipating about a semi a day of uh, a fish moving through moving through this uh, this system. And this is just an overview of the value chain. So again, the NIAC strain of Arctic char cultivated over 28 years. So we've got a really good handle on genetics, brood stock. Uh, again, the folks up in um, in Whitehorse were, you know, dealing with a world class company around that that handles the genetics and optimizes the the breeding program. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we determined we're going to need 10 million eggs to supply our own uh, meat, our own uh, supply, but we'll be growing, you know, in excess of 20 million, and that excess ova gets sold to the marketplace. Uh, again, primarily um, the higher volume is Europe that we do sell uh, across Canada. Uh, and again, our uh, fish is, um, it's about a 19 month cycle from, from uh, spawning to uh, harvest. And uh, we, our plan calls for uh, 1.5 to two kilograms uh, fish on the, uh, at the harvest side. And again, we process on site, that's the plan. And we have a significant plan for using the effluent water, recycling, uh, coal, uh, uh, Justin calls it not byproduct, but coal products. So some of the coal products are offal, which which goes to the, you know, primarily the pet food industry, but also will be producing significant fertilizer through uh, the extraction of the of the nitrates from uh, from the water in the dewatering process. And this is uh, sort of a highlight of production. So here's where we are today. We anticipate being fully built by summer 25. Again, we're currently selling through uh, the, our icy waters acquisitions. We do have OVA and meat sales throughout this period, which helps offset some of the working capital and uh, anticipate full production by uh, late 2026. And again, in terms of goal market strategy, we're, we feel we're blessed in terms of uh, being close to a ton of trucking companies, close to uh, Centerport, uh, you know, close to one of the only 24 hour uh, airports in uh, the country, uh, great cargo. Uh, we've, we're also, you know, Winnipeg being Winnipeg, we're very close to people like the World Trade Center, EDC, BDC, FCC, anything ending in a C, frankly. Uh, so we're, uh, and we've talked to the largest of the distributors about, and one of them even told us they want all our fish. So uh, we're pretty excited about our ability to, to sell what we're going to be producing. And this is a high level view of, of, of uh, so we've hired a firm from New York to help us with our capital plan. So we're raising 190 million. So this about 145 of that is the actual building and the equipment. We're gonna need about 27 million of working capital to take us through to the sales. And we built a nice buffer in there. So uh, uh, we actually have a significant funder here today meeting with us. So, uh, so this is moving along quite nicely. The fact that we're an ESG company, We've hired PricewaterhouseCoopers to do a significant ESG plan, working with RBC and their ESG team. Um, this is a this is a, a very friendly, you know, environmentally friendly project. Obviously, that we're that we're pretty excited about. We also hired a firm uh, uh, to do a third party analysis on the economic impact of this project. So this is again, this is uh, primarily directed to government, but also to uh, private funders. We're going to be driving about 450 million of economic activity, 56 million in annual GDP impact, 104 direct jobs, uh, 25 million in uh, taxes, at three levels of government on an annual basis. So this is a pretty big impact to the province. And these are our actual uh, fish. So this is uh, this is spawning time and up in uh, in Whitehorse. Uh, that's one of our employees there. I think it's a gorgeous fish. And then this is 529 who prepared some of appetizers for us for one of our events. And we're actually going to 529 tonight. But for those that don't know, that's a high end restaurant here in town. And their chef is really excited about our char. And we'll be hosting the equity, uh, potential equity partners to some great char tonight at the restaurant. And I think I respected my eight minute limit. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. 
Lots going on right there in Manitoba. Fantastic to hear. Sean, over to you. Well, it's great. Uh, I'm really happy to follow those guys. They, you really set the stage for the, you know, uh, for aquaculture in general with Justin's talk and kind of focused in on some stuff going on right in Manitoba. So that's excellent. Uh, I'm going to get into my uh, presentation. Um, hopefully uh, we can see that. <clears throat> Is that coming up on your screen? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so my name's Sean Pressey. Uh, thanks for the uh, the uh, uh, introduction earlier, RJ. So I come from a background of approximately about 30 years in the aquaculture industry, in the land-based sector uh, in Ontario, uh, primarily with rainbow trout, but also did some work with uh, Arctic char, uh, tilapia, and uh, Pacific white shrimp as well. And uh, uh, have uh, approximately, uh, I would say, just over a decade of experience in uh, RAS. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what Wabatech does. Uh, so I work for Wabatech Business Development Corporation. And I'm also going to go into some specifics of the program that we administer through Wabatech, which is called the Northern Integrated uh, Commercial Fisheries Initiative. So I'm going to be coming at this uh, from more so for uh, the benefit uh, of uh, First Nations. Uh, if there's anybody from First Nations community communities here, that's, this will probably be of interest to you. So uh, Wabatech Business Development Corporation is located in Whitefish River First Nation in Ontario. It's an Indigenous uh, owned and controlled organization, and they deliver uh, business financing uh, and economic development services to First Nations community in, uh, businesses located throughout uh, Northeastern Ontario. It's a member of the uh, uh, Network of Community Futures Development Corporation and also uh, Indigenous financial institutions in Canada. So uh, a little bit kind of zeroing in on, on Wabatech's aquaculture services. Uh, so there's uh, two uh, what we call uh, aquaculture development officers. There's myself and also uh, my colleague, uh, Nicholas Huber, who is a senior aquaculture development officer. And uh, we act as a business development team for aquaculture rela related activities and projects. And we administer a program uh, called the Northern Integrated Commercial Fishery Initiative. Um, uh, and this is uh, through DFO. Uh, we often, of course, we're going to short form it. So it's uh, the short form is, is NICFI for short. And this program is, uh, is available to help Indigenous communities and, and groups develop sustainable aquaculture operations. Kind of the four pillars of the program uh, are uh, capacity building, revenue uh, and profit generation, employment generation, and uh, ideally the self-sustainability of aquaculture operations. So our territory uh, that we cover, uh, so specifically for aquaculture, um, uh, both Nicholas and I, we cover the territory of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. So we have uh, a number of projects uh, on the go right now in Ontario. Um, we have one in, in, in Manitoba, a couple in uh, Saskatchewan, and uh, uh, as well in, in Alberta. So the program was officially launched in, in 2019, so it hasn't been around uh, all that long. <clears throat> and uh, we just extended our service contract for additional five years uh, uh, starting uh, this fiscal year, the 2023-2024 fiscal year. Uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, funded and administered by DFO, and uh, it's uh, facilitated and co-delivered uh, by Wabatech for Central Canada. Uh, and it's through the aquaculture uh, development uh, team that we have uh, can, su can support and, and uh, provide some expertise uh, through that uh, aquaculture development position. Uh, I should mention that uh, the NICV uh, also has kind of some sister programs, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. So on the East Coast, uh, it's called ICFI, so uh, Atlantic Integrated Commercial Fisheries Initiative. 
And on the West Coast, there's another program called the uh, PICV or the Pacific Integrated Commercial Fisheries. And we each have our own uh, pool of funds that we draw from uh, uh, in those programs. So the typical process uh, <clears throat> that we go through is we, uh, we start the process with uh, working with the community and uh, we develop an application uh, with the community. Uh, we then, of course, uh, submit that uh, application to the NICV program, and then the uh, Aquaculture Development Officer is available to present and defend that uh, uh, that application to the NICV community. So if it's approved, a letter of offer is uh, supplied dire directly from DFO in about four or five weeks after submission. The, the letter of offer is then accepted by uh, leadership. And uh, if it's accepted, a uh, contribution agreement is then sent out in a, in a couple of weeks of the acceptance of the letter of offer. And then shortly thereafter, uh, a check will be issued uh, for the project. A couple of uh, additional details. Um, Multi-year projects can be accepted and um, communities can participate year on year. So there's not kind of, it's not a one and done thing. So we can go uh, year after year. Uh, applications can be uh, uh, accepted all year round, uh, but we do have a soft cutoff around November 30th, and that's because this program is fiscally, year, is fiscally geared uh, in our fiscal year running from April 1st to uh, March 31st. 90% uh, of those funds are, 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 are available ahead of time, and uh, we uh, hold back about 10% uh, just until the project is complete and reporting is finished. Um, another important detail is the program can support 90% of the project costs. And uh, there's a 10% that has to come from the community. Uh, that will be a cash uh, contribution and not in kind. And we do have an unofficial capital of $150,000 per year uh, per community, but uh, uh, we've kind of proved uh, that we can kind of go above and beyond that uh, on a case by case basis. The one main uh, point here on the bottom is that the uh, community is the uh, proponent of the application. So it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not available for individual businesses uh, and like sole proprietors and, and that type of thing. Uh, <clears throat> here are just a few of the activities that we're able to support uh, with our funding. Uh, I don't have to list them all, they're all here, but uh, uh, really, we can get into anything that's kind of pre-development, like feasibility studies, business plans, uh, training and education, environmental baseline assessments, and that type of thing. And then we can get into uh, uh, supporting capital, uh, infrastructure, and equipment as well. And then we can also get into the uh, po some post-operational activities as well uh, with uh, increased training and uh perhaps additions to uh, uh, equipment and infrastructure as well. So the, uh, uh, the program is designed uh, to allow the aquaculture development officer to be a resource, uh, an asset and, that, and an ally. And uh, as I mentioned, to be uh, provide support for any, any aquaculture related activity uh, at any stage, whether it's pre-development uh, or post-operational. Um, we always want to make, ensure that the, the best interest of the community is always acknowledged and ensure, also ensure that all project, projects are feasible and sustainable. Uh, also very important, we're free resource to the, to the communities that we serve, so they don't have to pay us, um, uh, which is kind of nice. So there, uh, there are many communities uh, uh, out there right now that are not necessarily familiar with aquaculture. So uh, we, from time to time, and uh, probably about a couple times a year, we 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 host workshops in various uh, places around the country, just to kind of spread the word about aquaculture and uh, uh, try to connect with some some future clients. And we also, of course, uh, participate in some some teams and Zoom meetings as well to kind of pass on that information. Uh, if there's, uh, I'm just leaving a, a, a contact page here on the very uh, end of the uh, uh, screen. So if you uh, would like to get a hold of us, you can either uh, email us directly or uh, also I think what we'll do is we'll uh, include our uh, 
our uh, website link as well uh, for those that might want to check us out later on. Awesome. Thank you for that, Sean. And yeah, it's, I, I, uh, I know firsthand the good work that Wabatech does um, with communities in Ontario. So I'm excited to hear that same resource is, is available in Manitoba. So, um, okay, well, let me just share my screen real quick. Um, I really appreciate how the three of you gave a, a fulsome um, look at, at your backgrounds and, and some of the activities going on. I promise to be very quick as I do something similar. Everyone can see my screen? Perfect. No, we can see you, but not your screen. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do we see the presentation view or? Looks great. It yeah. Does? Looks oh. Okay. Perfect. Um, so yes, um, if you're talking about a uh, fish farmer that has grown those coho salmon eggs that you're talking about, Justin, and some of those Arctic char eggs that you're talking about, Chuck, that's me because I am a uh, a fish farmer here in Ontario. So my sister and I, both second generation, um, we raise uh, rainbow trout, coho salmon, and Arctic char. We have four land-based farms that are sort of part hatchery, part, part market growth. Um, and then as of two years ago, a new net pen operation up on Manitoulin in partnership with Shigawani First Nation. Uh, I'm also the managing director. It's a part-time gig for the Ontario Aquaculture Association. So one thing that, um, that I'm proud of we have here in Ontario and we would open up our arms um, to anybody in Manitoba is we have a really close-knit community of fish farmers and suppliers, research institutions and, and First Nations groups and um, that it, it have, have sort of worked around each other in, in different ways for, for decades. And I think having that close-knit community um, really does, does help advance all of us and lift all of us up. Our annual conference is in um, usually the end of March. And I believe last time and the time before that, we had some really good representation from farmers in Manitoba um, looking to sort of interact with, with other small and medium-sized freshwater farmers. So. Um, prior to coming back to the family farm, um, most of my 20s, I worked in science education and communication for um, a few different research institutes. And I'm just really passionate about growing sustainable food here in, in Canada. So, so we've, I think, alluded to this. Um, and Chuck, I really appreciated you, you, you talking about your conversations with um, distributors and, 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 and consumers because one thing that's really unique about our sector as compared to other um, agriculture sectors is that we face a supply issue. We know that we can be growing one, two, three, five times the amount of sustainable seafood in Canadian borders, and there's gonna be a home for it um, in retailers and in, in the food service industry. Um, sometimes you know, we, we hear about all the sort of money and grants flowing towards marketing and helping sales when really um, what we look for um, is help getting in farms up and producing um, because in, in Canada, there's the population's increasing, um, some of the immigrant population prefers fish to, to other protein sources. Um, the end consumer seems to be asking these questions about carbon emissions and environmental impact. And that always leads people to, to, to consider seafood options. And we're just seeing the impacts of, of the pressures on wild stocks. So. so in Ontario, you might be asking why they asked an Ontario producer today, but we have a... Uh, our, our aquaculture sector um, has been flourishing in different shapes and forms in Ontario since about the 1950s. Um, chances are, if it's been tried a certain technology or a certain species, um, I could find you somebody to regale you with stories here in Ontario. Um, and I think that there's lots that um, we can learn. And then I think we know that um, uh, a province like Ontario isn't going to meet the demand ourselves. There is a lot of opportunity for freshwater aquaculture within the interior provinces of Canada. Um, and I just want to see as much fish grown in this country as we can, as we can grow. 
So here's a quick look at Ontario. Um, we farm mainly rainbow trout over 90%. In Ontario, at least, trout has really been sort of the species that has been supplied consistently to market, allowed our um, our industry to, to grow, given us enough money to keep reinvesting and growing. Um, and then we continue to try new species um, and new types of farming. Um, and that's what you see on the right side. I'm going to share a sad story. Um, this slide is actually a year old. And in preparation for today, I actually looked at what's been happening in our sector in the last year. Um, and unfortunately we've seen um, some pretty, some farms close, um, some that we're trying new technologies or new approaches to things, or trying to sort of build a market out of, out of, um, out of nothing by sort of very niche species and things. We've seen some of those struggle throughout the pandemic. Um, and so really our sector is dominated by trout still, um, Arctic char and coho salmon, lots of growth opportunity there. Um, and then we have a new opportunity with Lake Whitefish, which is I think probably very applicable to the Manitoba context as well. Quick look at Ontario, we have about 35 farms in the commercial space, producing between 12 to 15 million pounds a, a year, mostly trout. Um, but the farm gate sales of that um, at 40 million is actually on par and some years exceeds what the entire Ontario commercial fisheries catches, which is a fun thing that we like to share because we don't need near the government's attention um, as, as, as that part of the, the sector. Um, and we just continue to, to grow, grow, grow. Uh, here's a look at where the farms are in Ontario. Uh, when you dive into it a little bit more, you actually see a lot of the uh, land-based and hatchery farms um, closer to the populated areas in mid south and midwestern Ontario. Um, we have a very um, thriving net pen sector in and around Manitoulin Island and Perry Sound up in the north. Uh, and then most of our processing happens in the south. And so before a rainbow trout in Ontario makes its way to market, um, it's pretty much traveled all across um, the, the, the bottom half of the province. Following sort of what some of Justin shared, here's what a, a sort of a traditional hatchery looks like. Um, concrete tanks, um, a lot of raceways. Um, the, the land-based farms in Ontario, we have some of the newer ones that would be completely recirculating. Those are typically more for the hatchery setting. It's a bit higher valued and can support that on a small scale. Um, but you also see a lot of the existing flow through operations adapting recirculating technologies. Uh, here in Ontario, um, we don't bring in, sorry, we um, produce most of our own rainbow trout eggs. We have been breeding trout since the 1950s. And so that's about 25 to 30 generations of trout that are very well accustomed to our hot, hot, hot summers and our cool, cool, cool winters. Um, the net pen sector um, is alive and well here in Ontario. Um, we have about a dozen sites, each between sort of 500 to 1,000 metric tons, um, mostly trout production. And I like to include this picture here on the top right, because contrary to our nice tropical friends in the ocean that it never freezes, it does freeze here. And I'm pretty sure it freezes in Manitoba as well. Um, and so we have a lot of sort of Ontario built and Ontario tested solutions for net pen farming in areas with freezing water. Um, and so in Ontario, even though these, the, the, the lake surface may freeze over, we're still pulling out fish about 48 weeks of the year that's going fresh into, into the, the markets. Aquaponics, I'm glad you mentioned that too, Justin. Um, we find here in Ontario, we've, we've some projects have really tried to scale up and run into some challenges with that, but they tend to focus more on the, the greens side. Um, but aquaponics, uh, we see it as sort of community level projects um, do quite well here in Ontario. And just a quick plug, um, the Ontario Aquaculture Research Center, which is linked to the University of Guelph, um, they are one of the secret sauces that we have here in central Canada. Um, they're a, a, a really fantastic research team, lots of research infrastructure, and they work both on the, the sort of multi-level 
big funded academic grants, but they also work direct with farmers. So if we're trying out a new nutraceutical or a new strain of something, or we want a new treatment for an eggs, they'll work directly with the farmers and, and sort of run tests and things in parallel. Um, and I know that if they got any calls from Manitoba, they would be over the moon, so. And before I get into some of the closing, I did want to highlight this message to you that there really isn't a best way to farm fish with all of the demand that we're seeing across the province um, and across the country and literally across the continent for sustainable seafood. Um, I really like to encourage people to see all these different types of farms as part of the silver bullet solution because there's space, especially in a huge land mass like Manitoba, um, for all sorts of different technologies from flow throughs to recirculating to net pens and some of the aquaponics. And a quick plug here, um, I think one of our major growth impediments, um, at least here in Ontario, is that a lot of knowledge gets or misconceptions get imported from elsewhere. So sometimes people hear about something happening halfway across the world or they hear about something in BC or what have you, and they assume that that's the case of everywhere. Um, and so I, I, I think we spend a lot of time as freshwater aquaculture producers sharing such amazing stories because as you can see on this slide here, there was a decade or more um, research study in the experimental lakes area, which is probably part of the landscape that is similar to Manitoba, um, where they actually put in a net pen farm to see if there was any sort of um, impacts on the local food webs or local um, ecosystem. And they actually found that the nutrients the farm added weren't hindering, they were actually helpful for the local food web and the wild lake trout populations doubled within five years. And that same work is being copied in Georgian Bay um, and we're looking to expand that elsewhere. So just um, planting a seed to, to encourage um, soaking up all, all options and exploring all opportunities when we're talking about farming fish. So yeah, major growth impediment, um, definitely those imported misconceptions, but I find that those sometimes can bleed into sort of the, the quick thinking of political staff or the more um, sometimes in the, the regulatory bureauc bureaucratic side. Um, and that just slows, slows, slows things down. I can't speak to the Manitoba experience, but I'm very excited that Manitoba Ag is supporting this webinar and, and, and looking towards the future for the sector. But we can definitely run into some of the, just the stagnation um, on the environmental regulatory side. But hey, um, the Manitoba opportunity, which I think we'll get into. Um, I wanted to mention here really quick um, that on, the Ontario government is supporting our association to do a market analysis for rainbow trout and a growth plan. Um, and we're very, very happy to share that because there hasn't really been a fulsome study for rainbow trout and steelhead trout um, and how the markets shifted over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, but that's um, where we're sort of already seeing that here in central Canada, we could be producing like five or seven or eight times the fish that we're producing and still find a, a home for it. And that's just rainbow trout. I mean, Chuck is, is sharing about a species like Arctic char that's established, but has huge, huge, huge opportunity. So plus one thing I'm jealous of is it's really hard in Ontario to sell into British Columbia, huge seafood um, opportunity in, um, in Canada. Um, because we have this big old province in the way, which is Manitoba. Um, and, but you guys are right there and can service that market, which I think would be a huge, a huge success for multiple different species. So I will close on, on, uh, on that presentation. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so why don't we get into some questions really quickly? Um, I know we've, we've taken up some time. Um, but Justin, why don't I toss it over to you? What specific opportunities within the aquaculture sector can investors explore in Canada? And how would Manitoba fit into that? Yeah, uh, thanks, RJ. Uh, you know, the, the vast majority of aquaculture uh, production in, in Canada is in salmon net pens uh, on, and on both coasts. Uh, investment, on, unfortunately, there is uh, screech to the to a halt a, a little bit um, with the regulatory uncertainty uh, in those areas. I think that the province is 
have opportunities right now and, and Manitoba has a great opportunity right now to enable uh, aquaculture development uh, and has been discussed here as uh, with the demand growing uh, faster than the, the supply uh, and, and global limitations on on uh, net pen production for salmon, not just in, in Canada, but uh, ar around the world. Uh, the time uh, is, is, uh, is a really good opportunity right now uh, for different types of uh, culture systems and, and for, for aquaculture in, in Manitoba. Thank you. And so Chuck, as you've been having a lot of these really big conversations um, uh, for Sapphire Springs about aquaculture and, and seizing opportunities. What would you say is your perspective on the current state of aquaculture in Canada? Um, and can you share any sort of good stories and exciting opportunities that, that you found in those, those big chats? Yeah, well, we're certainly getting a lot of enthusiasm from, from you know, places like the banks and and we are already we're, we're we've declared we're working with rbc they and they have a very they have a green fund they have a they have an esg mandate um and we've also hired price waterhouse coopers that has uh, committed as a firm i think they've committed 12 billion uh, worldwide to esg so they're helping us establish our esg strategy for the, so that whole move to there's a lot of pressure what i'm learning on banks and on large firms from shareholders that they start investing in in environmentally friendly projects so from that perspective we're really well positioned and um, in addition i like what you said about the demand again this large supplier that i i won't name but they're big <laughs> has said that for the last seven years the demand for salmonids has outstripped the supply by 10%. And so they said the market will suck up everything you produce. And so we're really excited about that. And so, uh, yeah. And, and again, the technologies that has improved and people like Justin and, and um, people in the industry have a lot of uh, interesting knowledge to, to bring to the table. So, yeah, I just think it's a really exciting time right now. And we're blessed in, in Manitoba with uh, relatively, uh, cheap power compared to other parts of the world. The water comes out of the ground exactly what we were looking for. And I might may add one thing to your slide on what are some of the impediments. Um, and, and one of those is we're going to need more power, right? right? So, so in, under the heading, you know, we're going to be looking for assistance from governments. It'll be encouraging, in our case, uh, manageable hydro to, to make available the level of power that we need to, to feed our system. But uh, all in all, the everyone's. Uh, I'm really excited about the level of interest from everybody. The other interesting stat that I like to throw out is uh, it's anticipated that 300 billion dollars will come into this into land-based system. So, uh, you know, we're only taking up a very small percentage of that. <laughs> so we're quite excited about that as well. I can echo the even the power concerns, even when we're talking about farming fish in remote areas as well. But um, yeah, we, we find in Ontario that even though we're expanding at sort of 10 to 15% per year, we're still not keeping up with market share. There's a lot mm -hmm. more opportunity there. Um, Sean, maybe I'll ask you, what would you say are some of the specific species or tech or practices that investors could focus on when they're looking for a competitive edge? Um, well, Ideally, in, in like you say, when there's more supply or sorry, more demand than supply in often cases, there's not really a lot of competition necessarily to sell your products. So it's good that uh, they don't have to, to compete that way. Um, <clears throat> I think RAS has been around uh, a long time and, and it's um, in its in its form. I don't think there's really a lot of uh, really drastically new and and exciting things that have come out recently in RAS. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, the, the, the technology has been around uh, a long time. We're refining different things, uh, some in, in into details, you know, getting into to understanding more of what's going on in RAS on a, at a biological level, which is good. And I think uh, that's really important, I think, for, for anybody in RAS these days is to, to get a really good understanding of what's going on at a microbial level within an RAS system, because that can make a really big Im impact to a system, whether it's going to 
thrive or whether it's going to cause you a lot of difficulties uh, down the road. So I think that's uh, in right now, I think that's a, that would probably be a little bit of a competitive edge perhaps to uh, somebody in RAS right now. Jack, over to you. Yeah, a quick, uh, just a comment on that in terms of some of the trends that I'm seeing. The only knock on our industry right now is really the fact that we still feed fish primarily, you know, other fish, right? And so, so we're we're committed uh, on the research side, which is why we were excited about working with Dr. Wendy at Bannerstein on the introduction of things like soldier flies into, into feed, into the, the, the feed system. And so we're of the opinion, anything we can do to lessen the reliance on wild caught fish to feed our fish is going to be great for the environment. And so, and I think that'll introduce some interesting opportunities, even with the indigenous communities where we've, we've had some conversations here about setting up a feed plant using some of the off species fish that are harvested in Lake, in, in Lake Winnipeg, which is the, 10th largest lake in the world or 11 if you count the Caspian Sea as a lake which it, which it is and so uh, we're, we're excited about the about you know understanding the full value chain and what innovation can we bring through Canadian companies and partnerships like the Indigenous to 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 supply feed that's better that's easier on the environment so I'm excited about that aspect of it as well yeah and I can um I can echo that because a few years ago, we asked some of the feed companies, could you explore like algal oils, you know, as a substitute for fish meal that have the omegas. And it was like, uh, oh, those are too expensive. That's a crazy idea. And just this past quarter, they called us and they said, so fish oil is so expensive now. Um, we're going to look at algal oils. <laughs> like, Great. <laughs> so there's, there's opportunity there. So, um, I do have, while we're talking about feed, there was a question from the audience and it said, what are your thoughts about using plant-based proteins for feed ingredients because of Manitoba's strong agriculture community? Well, I know we're talking about fish, fish meal substitutes, but does anyone want to, anything know about that or want to address that question? At the risk of uh, talking over the expert, Justin, I'll leave you <laughs> my, my perception from what I've, what I've heard is uh, for in insects, for instance, are natural, like fish eat insects, right? So that's a more natural uh, source, but there's certainly, obviously we've asked the question, you know, given, you know, Richardson's here and there's a Portage Developmental Center. I used to run the St. Bonavis Hospital Foundation and we had uh, this uh, Canadian Center for Agri-Food Research is here in the, in the city. So we have a lot of resources here to, to do that research. Um, but again, I think it's still, and I think there's some soy and but uh, uh, that's being used, but I'll pass it over to Justin. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. I, I and I, I agree um, with that. And there's a huge opportunity for uh, feed ingredients. Uh, the uh, costs right now for some of the traditional ingredients for salmonid feeds, uh, fish meal, fish oil, uh, have been extremely high. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, research being carried out to find uh, what we can use to uh, substitute and to complement uh, those other ingredients. Uh, what we need uh, to make sure we do is is the research and the trials on new ingredients uh, just to find out what uh, the impact is on the fish um, health, uh, quality of the fish and, and performance of the fish. Uh, but no question, uh, that's uh, definitely a direction that the industry has to take and, and could be a, a good opportunity for other uh, types of farms, terrestrial farming in, in uh, Manitoba uh, to provide some of those ingredients. Thank you for that. So um, I have sort of a list of questions here and some questions from the um, from the audience, but I you, you you are you have such thorough answers. You're just like addressing them all in one fellow swoop. Um, I got some, I got a note from one of the organizers that they would like to extend ten minutes to to um, ten more minutes past the end just to continue some of these conversations. One of the questions I wanted to direct to you, Justin, and then open to everybody. Um, we're talking about how we build farms, but perhaps to shift to how we sell the fish out of it. What do you think are some of the main things to consider when we're putting a marketing or sales plan together for a new operation or, or growing an existing operations? 
Um, and where should we be looking to sell this stuff? Yeah, good, uh, good question, um, RJ. Uh, for for marketing, you know, it, it totally depends on on the species that that you'll uh, culture, uh, <clears throat> because it's going to be uh, a little bit uh, different uh, for the species, um, and and uh, is your production uh, seasonal? Uh, is it year round? Uh, I think that Manitobas are um, really well suited to uh, bring a. Um, any any species uh, to the market because of the position in in Manitoba within uh, 24 hours, and I think Chuck might have mentioned this. Uh, there are 100 million people uh, within 24 hours of of trucking, uh, you know, from uh, Winnipeg. And so there's a, a really uh, big market there uh, for for salmon, I, and you know you can you can fit into uh, an existing market to develop something like Arctic char. Uh, it um, it'll take uh, definitely a, a big a marketing push to uh, create awareness. You know, with a, a species where there where there isn't a huge amount on uh, in the market, a lot of people don't know what Arctic char is. Uh, so there'll be uh, an educational uh, awareness campaign uh, to develop. And that's something that uh, where the province of Manitoba could perhaps uh, step in and, and help with uh, marketing from uh, for species uh, grown here in the province. Thank you. Sean, I saw you go off mute. Did you have anything to say? No. No. Okay. Just, just at the ready, that's all. Okay. Um, so um, I might toss this one to you, Chuck, because um, I know you've you've mentioned a little bit on the private financing side and some of these these big um, firms like RBC. Where have you been looking or finding success on the government incentive side, either direct financing or or incentive side for aquaculture in Manitoba? It's a great question, and uh, it's really the uh, it's why we produce this uh, handsome uh, economic <laughs> development economic impact report. <laughs> and so, yeah, so we've we've obviously been in discussion with uh, with the folks, uh, the economic development folks in Manitoba. We had an election that's kind of you know uh, uh, put things on hold, but we're, we're we're just restarting those conversations. So obviously, there's a there's a a conversation going on with our own province and also federally there's a number of programs out there federally so we do believe you know that's my favorite word non-dilutive funding we do believe that the, and we've already got the support from the, the manitoba here has a unique program and it's my favorite acronym sbvctc which is a, a small business venture capital tax credit where uh, uh, we've got a series some preferred shares that we're selling right now uh, and we're allowed to sell up to 10 million of those and the government will provide a 45% tax credit. So it's really, it's quite beneficial to the, in, to the private investor. So I consider that a four and a half million dollar grant uh, already has been uh, granted to us. So yeah, we, so we got great support from the province and, um, and federally we're, we're starting to make those, those contacts as well. We had a good question um, from the audience. Kevin Loftus asked, what's the most significant constraints to aquaculture development in Manitoba? Is it, regu is it the regulatory environment, the investment dollars, the technical knowledge? Um, if you had to sort of zero in on some of the biggest constraints, what might you say? Well, I think right now it's we want to make sure we have access to power. We got a couple of years to figure this okay. out. So we're going to that's a that's a big one but that's you know um i would say that on on the funding side again we're working with good people from we've actually hired a firm from new york and they've been fantastic and they brought us there were a number of canadian funds actually that are focused on on food security on vertical farming aquaculture so the private capital is out there and um and it's a question of putting together the right package to uh to attract track the right To, to follow up on that, um, yeah. what uh, what uh, Chuck pointed out about uh, power, I think uh, a key component of that is um, is for the province to prioritize aquaculture projects. If if uh, you know if you want to do a project and 
and then it takes uh, two years to bring power in. It's it's uh, pretty hard to get that momentum. Uh, so you know, a, a short uh, turnaround time to to provide uh, the power, uh, I think, is is helpful. Uh, you know, perhaps I don't know in Manitoba if there are some uh, reduced uh, power uh, rates for agriculture or uh, or aquaculture, but that could be. Uh, an incentive for Manitoba uh, to do uh, something like that, um, and and not just uh, electricity, but other ser- you know bringing services to sites uh, that can that can help uh, st- you know stimulate uh, aquaculture development. And um, I feel like I have lots of Manitoba specific questions. So, so sorry, Sean, I have one for you after this one but us uh, Ontario guys. Um, but, you know, I mentioned the, the University of Guelph here in Ontario and, and how they support aquaculture. Um, what sorts of collaboration opportunities, Chuck or Justin, have you come across with, with sort of local universities or research institutions that you think investors could take advantage of to get involved in the sector? I, I can... Uh take a, a shot at that although I, I'm not sure specifically in in um, uh, Manitoba but there are um, uh, universities in in Manitoba and, and there is a focus on on agriculture uh, so potentially there, there could be an opportunity uh, there I know in some areas uh, you know RJU showed the research uh, center there in in Ontario. Uh, so it sounds like a great opportunity for a partnership there. Um, you know, with a lot of the questions that that uh, came in about uh, feed, uh, you know, it's something like that that you have to use. You have to carry out the the research at at a facility like that uh, to be able to develop um, you know, feed ingredients or or anything else uh, with the with the fish. So. Um, Sorry, at that I don't have uh, specific uh, partnerships in in Manitoba, uh, but uh, definitely the partnerships are are needed. Uh, so we'll be we'll be looking uh, looking out for those. Okay. And if I and if I can add to that, you know, again, uh, U of M is my alma mater, and we have uh, great contacts into into the food research side of of things. We've also hired a guy named Dr. Michael Paps, who's a U of M grad, and he was one of the first researchers at the DFO site that we acquired. So he spent 30 years there. He put the first fish in the first tank and now he's working with us. And uh, and a lot of that research that was done by the feds, I think is actually at Guelph right now. I think it was sent back out East. And, and uh, so we definitely want to, uh, that's on our list is to strengthen that relationship with Guelph and with other uh, centers out there um, as well. Thank you, Chuck and Justin. Um, so we're just a few minutes left. So I have sort of one, one question, um, I'll direct it to you, Sean, but I welcome everyone's opinions. But, you know, um, Sean, you were talking about the the NICFI funding going towards the whole feasibility side and, and working with the communities to get these projects off the ground. Where do you think investors could go to understand all the risks and rewards and long-term benefits when they are sort of just preliminarily assessing feasibility of new ideas, let's say? What are some go-to resources? Um, well, that's a tough one, really. Uh, there's not a lot of them I, that I know of out there to kind of assess those things uh, on an individual basis. I think if you do, you're going to, you know, ask questions. Um, like we do have our, our resource, uh, like through our website that has a lot of information uh, that's contained there. Uh, you know, it's kind of specifically is for First Nations, so it's not necessarily for investors uh, and that type of thing. But uh, but I guess accessing as much of those, uh, you know, information off the web, uh, reaching out to uh, to other people if you can. I think a lot of, believe it or not, I think a lot of fish farmers are fairly approachable and uh, will answer questions that you might have, you know, especially if somebody is looking at something and, you know, uh, you always have those questions. Well, I want to raise X fish and it's like a totally exotic fish. Uh, and there's a lot of 
you know, there will be a lot of issues that will come up uh, when you're when you're raising a new and emerging species. So, uh, so I guess for an investor, they just have to start reaching out and, and finding those connections uh, through uh, through universities, extension services, uh, websites uh, like like the one we have. Ideally, uh, you know, the, the, the Manitoba government would probably have a lot of in, that information, uh, uh, I guess, in the future, not necessarily right now, but as they kind of accumulate a little bit of information and uh, and uh, and knowledge, they can kind of have those those uh, answers up there. Um, the Ontario Aquaculture Association website has a lot of information, a little bit of plug there Thanks. for that. Um you know, we've uh, the industry in Ontario has been around a long time. We've seen a lot of ups and downs uh, in the industry. So, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> but really, I think it's just doing hitting the ground uh, and 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 doing your own research. Yeah. Uh, there there may be other places out there that I don't know of. Um, right now, I kind of live in you know what I mean in, in uh, servicing First Nations, so that's where I have my uh, like I kind of wear that hat now and uh and we know that we know that let's say our environment very well but uh i don't necessarily i'm, I'm up to date on what's going on uh outside of that bubble for me anyways i can echo that too because uh we're in this environment where we're not always directly competing for for market share i, I find fish farmers to be very open-minded I, I don't suggest the long i get lots of 20 question emails people ask me to answer things on email i don't love that but if anyone ever shows up at the farm um like i showed up in the yukon at icy waters on my honeymoon and they just opened the doors and showed me around um i find there's lots of knowledge knowledge sharing um just like that so Okay, well, that draws us to our 10 minute extension. Um, Sean, Chuck and Justin, I really wanted to thank you for joining me on this panel discussion today, talking about the big opportunities in Manitoba. Um, and I know that the our friends at Manitoba Agriculture, um, I really wanted to thank them. They put a lot of organization into this. Uh, and as a, as a fish farmer, um, I'm always, always trying to hammer in that fish farmers are farmers too. Um, I'm kept awake with the same old things, and I'm sure Chuck is too, than most other farmers out there. Um, and for, for, for the, the agriculture ministry to pull something like this together and, and, and focus on um, really the, the, the long-term opportunity for, for this sector, uh, we're very excited about that. So thank you for that. And uh, I look forward to working with lots of new Manitoba farmers. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.